chapter 16, verse uh, 1 to 27. <coughs> Excuse me, actually we'll finish the uh, epistle this morning, and then uh, next week we'll do uh, <coughs> an overview uh, of the book. That way it'll kind of help prepare you for the final. <laughs> I know some of you have not been taking notes like you should. And, uh, remember we said the final's not going to come from me, it's people out there. When they walk up to you and ask you questions about your faith, how you know you're saved, whether it's by grace or not, to be able to explain those things. Uh, you know, is God going to judge everybody? Is that equal? Well, all the sin and come sure of the glory of God. So uh, the final test is out there. And uh, again, Peter says, be always ready to give every man a, a reasonable answer, a reason for the hope that lies within, and do that with the, uh, with the humility and meekness. So we're hoping the study has uh, done that, and we'll have an overview next week. Well, again, final greetings. This could be really part two of last week in terms of Paul's heart, his motiv motivation for, for ministry as it continues on. Uh, it is a long list of, uh, of names uh, of the people that he is, uh, apparently knows there in the church in Rome. Some he's heard about them. Some he knows because of his missionary travels. There's a group of folks that are, uh, that are with him. And uh, what it reveals to us certainly, though, about Paul's heart is, well, he was a people person, which we don't really think about think about him as a great, being a great evangelist, we think about him as a great theologian, we think about him as being somebody who's an academic, uh, somebody who is highly in intellectual, uh, but you usually don't find those kinds of people being real people persons as well. Uh, it's also just amazing, uh, as you read through his letters, they're all like this at the end, where he's greeting people and all these people by name, and he didn't even have a smartphone where he could go to his contacts. Uh, it's been suggested that these are people he was probably praying for on a regular basis just to keep their uh, the names uh, in, uh, in his mind. And he does make reference to his prayers for those in the various churches. But uh, it speaks to us, of, uh, again, the importance of, of relationship. And we're reminded, as one writer said, that <clears throat> we live now in a heartless world. Uh, a recent uh, United States census, census missed, they missed 5.7 million people who were anonymous even to uh, uh, the census takers. Uh, every year, thousands of unidentified and even unidentifiable bodies are found across North America. Only about one out of 20 such bodies ever has a name attached to it. Our society has become a breeding ground for lonely people. Life in today's world is very much like the unwritten rule in elevators. No talking, smiling, or eye contact allowed without written consent of the management. I'm not sure if you've actually seen one of those sites before, but it seems like it sometimes. And if someone dares speaks, it's like nobody knows how to how to quite uh, quite react to it. But uh, uh, a world of lonely people. Uh, one survey in regards to uh, churches near uh, near Houston found out uh, what motiv motivated people to go to a particular church or congregation. Uh, these are some of the answers. 12% uh, chose their church because of prior denominational affiliation. 8% on the basis of architectural beauty and structure. I know many of you are here for that, <laughs> that reason. 3% because of the person in the pulpit. Now that just disappoints me. 3%? <laughs> Come on. Uh, Come on. 18% because of convenience of location. 21% because of people in the congregation whom they respected, but a whopping 37% were influenced by the fact that friends and neighbors took an interest in them and invited them. That's, that's mainly how people uh, get to a church. We've also often, I've heard it said to me, and I believe it's true, that people will come to a church for a lot of different reasons. They'll only stay for one, and that's if they make a relationship with someone. Uh, it's, uh, it's meant to be part of the church, part of uh, having a relationship with Christ, to have a relationship with others, and, uh, and certainly Paul, Paul has that uh, with, uh, with people. Well, let's look first at his uh, request for assistance <coughs> for this <coughs> sister in the Lord named uh, Phoebe. <coughs> you don't mind if I take a drink of water after all. It's just us. <laughs> of course, in the thousands out there in by the way, man, the webcast with the Great Lord thing was awesome uh, yesterday. We had a great time, and, uh, and um, 
I, yeah, I, you just, but let's, let's pray because that thing's going to happen again uh, in about an hour and 45 minutes. It'll be the, the Sunday night. Uh, there were probably hundreds, of, if not a couple of thousand or more that got saved that we can see in the arena through the webcast, but there, this thing's going uh, around the world. So uh, it's really going to mess up the guy that edits, edits the, uh, the message later for radio. But let's, let, let's pray for that this afternoon. Father, we do want to lift up the, uh, the crusade there with, uh, with Pastor Greg. We pray once again for his voice, and we know that uh, uh, he's struggling with a bit of a cold and sounded very clear yesterday. We pray that would be again the case tonight. We pray for open hearts and minds, not only there in Philadelphia, but across the world. Everybody that's got a smartphone or is in a venue, a church, uh, some kind of meeting hall, and uh, we heard stories of people listening from India to Nepal, across the world, on webcast. And we just pray you'd uh, move in a mighty way and, uh, and uh, draw men and women and children to faith in you this afternoon. Afternoon for us, evening for them. Lord, pray your uh, blessing on the crusade there. Pray for the webcast. No glitches with Google or anything, Lord. Everything would go stream through uh, beautifully so people could... Uh, really have that sense that you're speaking to them through Greg's message. Uh, we lift all that to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, Phoebe, uh, she's uh, mentioned here in the first couple of verses. Paul says, I commend you to Phoebe, our sister, who's a servant of the church in uh, Sincrea. You may receive her in the Lord in a manner uh, worthy of the saints and the sister in whatever business she has need of you. For indeed, she has been a helper of many and of myself uh, also. So uh, four terms he uses for uh, this uh, this gal. She's a sister, a servant, a saint, uh, and a great help. Uh, and he makes several reasons for this uh, request to uh, a sister. Uh, one, uh, she apparently is a member of the church at uh, Sincrea, which is near Corinth, and that's where Paul's writing from. Uh, secondly, <coughs> and he probably, he spent about a year and a half there, and he probably won, uh, probably uh, through his preaching is how she came to faith in Christ though we don't know for sure, but obviously very close to him. He mentioned she's a sister uh, in the Lord. And, uh, and of course, that's, that's the way that uh, we refer to each other in terms of the body of Christ, that we are and should treat each other uh, as brothers uh, and sisters uh, in the Lord. And, uh, and of course, uh, this means that they were related by blood, the blood of Jesus Christ. And, uh, and sometimes, you probably agree, it's those people that we're related to in that way sometimes are closer to the people that are actually in our own, our own families. Now, if you've got believers in your family, that, uh, uh, that's a double blessing and everything. Uh, but uh, it is a blessing to have brothers and sisters uh, uh, in Jesus Christ. And she is mentioned as that. Uh, third, very interesting, as a servant of the Lord, but the word that he chooses, of course, he had, and he had a lot of choices in Greek, uh, but he uses the word deacon but a, a feminine uh, form of, of deacon. So this is a woman that held an official position uh, within, uh, within that church there in the first century and always gets kind of a, a controversy in terms of uh, women in ministry and qualifications and uh, the positions they, they can hold. And I don't want to digress too, too much, but just uh, to mention a couple of things. Over in 1 Timothy 3 is where Paul gives clarification on the qualifications for leadership in the church. And in the first seven verses, he talks about uh, the bishop or the, or, or the elder, uh, the, the pastor-teacher types. Uh, there he says uh, in, uh, in 1 Timothy 3, 2, uh, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband uh, of one wife. Uh, down in verse 4, having his children in submission with all reverence, for if a man does not know how to rule his own household, how will he take care of, care of God's church? So the, the person... Uh, in the church, according to the Bible, I mean, people would say, well, society's different now. Well, like, good, good for you on that. But according to the God uh, in, the, in the church, uh, uh, men are supposed to be running the show. Uh, why? Well, it's actually a, a picture of the family, uh, where the guys to be the head of the home as well. Uh, you would it'd be kind of funny if, uh, you know, God say, you know, here, here, here's the husband, the wife's be in submission with him, and all this stuff. There's a mutual submission and, and so forth. But, you know, somebody's. The, the, the buck stops somewhere. Somebody's got the responsibility and everything. Uh, but we're going to flip it on its head in the church. That, that wouldn't really make sense. What, it's really a picture. So in the first seven verses, the elder, we'd say board of directors, board of trustees, people that are overseen uh, with authority in the church uh, are, are guys. 
kind of hard to be uh, a gal and be the husband of one wife. He said, no, all pretty quick. So verse. Uh, then in verse 8, uh, he says, and likewise deacons, that's our word, likewise deacons must be reverent. Uh, and the word likewise means in the same way, in the same way that uh, there's these qualifications for elders, uh, in the same way, likewise, uh, deacons have qualifications for them as well. Uh, and uh, then in verse 11, we get another likewise, likewise, in exactly the same way uh, as you know, the deacons we're talking about. It says their wives must be reverent. Uh, it goes on uh, and mentions a, a few other things. What's confusing in this passage and other passages is that the same Greek word for wife uh, and for woman is gune. It's the same. It's the same word. It makes no distinction. So therefore, the translators then make, make the distinction on their own. They're supposed to make it in terms of context uh, and so forth. I think sometimes they make the translation in English uh, maybe uh, based on prejudice sometimes rather than the, the reality of what the, the text is even, uh, even saying. So really, verse 11 there in First Timothy could be like, likewise uh, the women who are like, like what? Like the deacons, the women that are deacons must be reverent, so and so and so forth. So uh, you've got uh, women in the early church like Phoebe uh, that meet these qualifications uh, and they're ministering and they hold an official uh, uh, position in the church. Paul's going to make reference to the business that she's uh, carrying out there. Uh, and again, there's a lot of writers believe that part of it was she delivered the letter. Pretty, pretty heavy response, responsibility. Uh, but she's a deacon uh, in the church. Uh, really, the, the only restrictions for, for gals serving in the church is, uh, is two things. They, uh, they must be in submission to their own husbands if they're married. But the Bible doesn't teach that all women are supposed to be in submission to all men. That's, that's not in there. It's wives uh, to, their, to their husbands. Uh, and then they can't be an elder. So that's, uh, uh, that's, that's that. And uh, try not to uh, rib each other too much as I go through this, yes. But the, uh, but, uh, the women in the early church certainly uh, carried out uh, uh, tremendous responsibility. And we can think about the, the daughters of Philip that had given prophecy and so forth. Uh, they were a, certainly an integral part of the church and church ministry. Uh, you know, if you're not sure on our position uh, in this, uh, just look around because there's a lot of women that are deaconing. I mean, they're, they're all over the place serving and doing things, and uh, just to be quite frankly, the church probably fall apart without them. So uh, we're, we're thankful for the, uh, the women that uh, uh, have uh, spheres of influence and, uh, and are part of the ministry uh, here, here at the church. But so she's a very unique gal. She's got a, uh, an official position with the church as a deacon. Uh, she's, uh, uh, as far as Paul's concerned, she's uh, a sister in the Lord. And so he basically kind of gives the exhortation she should be assisted. And a sister in whatever business she has need of you. Any way that you can help, or any way you can help uh, somebody in ministry uh, as part of the church, uh, be willing to help them certainly would be the, the application. Uh, even this word uh, uh, you know, help is very interesting. Uh, he says, uh, for indeed she has been a helper of many uh, and of mine also. Uh, and that word helper could be translated protector or one who stands before others. So he says uh, she's done this for many in the church here and for me also. Uh, and so therefore a sister when she comes. So very a very personal reference here to Phoebe and the need for her being assisted. Secondly then, and here's the, the longer list, verse uh, 3 to 16. He brings special attention to fellow workers and, uh, and there's many. Some of these names might be familiar. Greek Priscilla and Aquila or Aquila. Uh, my fellow workers in Christ who risked their, their own necks for, for my life. I thought that was like a contemporary phrase. Risked his neck apparently. That's, a, that's an old one. To him uh, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles likewise greet the church that is in their house. Greet my beloved uh, uh, Anatus, who is the first fruits of a camp to Christ and greet Mary, who labored much for us. Greet uh, uh, Andronicus and Judea, my countrymen and my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. Greet uh, and, and Pelias, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ. Natius, my beloved 
of Helas, approved in Christ. Greet those who are of the household of Aristbulus, and greet uh, Herodian, my countrymen. Greet those who are of the household of Narcissus. There's a wonderful name for you. Biblical name. Who are in the Lord. Greet uh, uh, Tryphenia and Tryphosa, uh, who have labored in the Lord. Greet the beloved Paris, who labored much in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. I uh, greet uh, uh, and syncre uh, Syncretus, uh, Philgron, Hermos, Patrophos, Hermas, and the brethren who are with them greet uh, uh, Philologus and Julia uh, Nereus and his sister Olympus and the saints who are with them. Greet one another with the holy kiss of churches of Christ. I greet you. So special attention given uh, here. Uh, first, uh, just uh, as we said, the heart of Paul. The word greet appears 19 times, 17 times are, are by Paul. Uh, he features 33 names here, 24 uh, in Rome, 17 men, 7 women. Uh, in addition, he mentions two households, uh, Rufus and Nerus. Uh, nine of the people mentioned are with Paul in Corinth, eight men, one woman. Uh, and uh, obviously, Paul uh, maintained incredible relationships with people. And uh, again, in the study of the book of Acts, you'll find he and Barnabas, he and Silas, going out of their way to make sure they can get to and find and check up on uh, how people are doing in these churches where they've uh, uh, brought the ministry of, of the gospel. He does that in Acts 15, 36, after their first missionary journey, where he says, then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are, are doing. So again, uh, what we see here is friendship is not determined on the basis of intellectual capability or theological literacy. Uh, Paul, again, Paul's a, he's like a literary giant, man. He's a very smart guy. But uh, he just knows all these people and cares about them, and it's uh, very interesting. Uh, again, we saw the, the motivation for ministry uh, last week, and even in these, uh, these greetings, we see... Uh, uh, the tremendous heart here that he has for them. I mean, you can imagine Paul going to these places. You know, he spent a couple of years in Ephesus, a year and a half in Corinth, but a lot of these were much quicker. And preach the gospel, people get saved. He's there to disciple them for a couple of months. And okay, you're an elder, you're an elder, and you're an elder, and uh, do the best you can, and I'll try to get back to you, you know, next winter or something. And then boom, he's on. And very concerned about them and their their growth. And of course, we have the, then the letters being written uh, and so forth. But uh, uh, how precious it must have been for Paul to actually get there and show up and, and see them and, uh, and be greeted uh, in, uh, and so forth. I, I just thought about this in terms of, uh, <clears throat> you know, we've done a lot of trips to, to China, you know, a dozen or whatever, dozen working trips, smuggling Bibles and everything. And we've kind of gone in with uh, a couple of different guys. Uh, but one of them, uh, Alan and Cecilia Newdeck, they're, uh, they're still part of Pastor Chuck's uh, uh, church there. And uh, Al's kind of a, a Charlie type of guy. I think he's about uh, 87, still a younger guy compared to Charlie. Uh, still going to, I just, just read his phrase for his last trip uh, to China, taking materials in. But Al's been doing this uh, for 30 years, more. Uh, traveling as a courier all over and uh, took an early retirement so he could move to Hong Kong and live there for a number of years just so he could serve the Lord in that capacity. Uh, Later, uh, they moved back to uh, Southern California, and uh, and we uh, started on with, uh, with our other brother that we, we do uh, ministry with down there now. Kind of picked up uh, where Al left off, but we got to go on a trip with Al one time, uh, and it was later uh, when he was living in Southern California. We went to a place that he'd been going to for a very long time, and uh, you know I just remember the scene going into this this uh, one little church, and there was enough older Chinese people in this church to know Al for like 20 plus years. And just the way they greeted him, and just wept because because he was there again. And they, and they just kept telling us how much it's meant to them over the years. It's this, we can't even calculate the number of Bibles and books and study materials that Al's brought uh, over the years. Uh, anyway, I, I think of a scene like that, you know, when Paul would Paul would show up. Somebody that's, uh, you know, you know, this is beyond the pale in terms of what this guy is willing to do. What certainly, uh, not comparison to what Paul did in, in those days of travel, uh, but uh, very close relationships, uh, not determined 
on the basis of intellectual capability or theological literacy, just on the love of Christ. Secondly, then, as we kind of look at some of these groups of people, and I try to break them into groups, uh, there's special attention given, let's just say, in Thanksgiving, because Paul's thankful for his friends. And he mentions Priscilla and Aquila. We're introducing them in Acts chapter 18. I'll, I'll read a couple of verses from that <coughs> in a moment. But uh, again, we'll see that they're tent maker. They're in the same trade as Paul. Uh, the Lord uh, tremendously uses them in the life of the early church. Uh, wherever they go, it seems like they've got a church uh, in their home. Uh, Luke writes this uh, about the meeting in, uh, in Acts 18. Uh, after these things, Paul departed from Athens, went to Corinth, that's where he's writing from now, uh, and he found a certain uh, Jew named uh, Aquila, or Aquila, born in Pontius, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius com had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for by occupation they were tent makers, and he reasoned in the synagogue every Shabbat or Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and, uh, and Greeks. So uh, again, just you know, love the little details. Uh, when, when did it happen? 44 AD. How do we know that? Because historically that is when Claudius, who was a, a madman in terms of the, uh, the emperor, brutal, a uh, brutal dictator, uh, and it's in 44 AD when he drives uh, and uh, all the Jews that were living in the city of Rome out of Rome. Uh, and again, when the Bible mentions something and we look at history, we, we always find a direct, a direct correlation. Uh, but uh, they mentioned their occupation as being tent makers. That's what Paul did for, uh, for a living. And so they, uh, they fellowship together. I'm sure Paul spent some time discipling them. If you go on reading the rest of the chapter, uh, they, uh, they end up uh, running into a guy named Apollos who is uh, mighty uh, in the word, a uh, great preacher and so forth. They, but he only knows about John the Baptist. Uh, he, he didn't even know that Jesus came yet or anything. He only knows about John the Baptist preaching repentance because the Messiah is coming. Uh, they're gracious enough not to interrupt the guy. <laughs> it says they took him aside quietly, privately, and taught him the better way. They, they explained who Jesus was, the Messiah, and so forth. Uh, it kind of trained him up, and then, uh, then he's tremendously used, uh, used by the Lord. But uh, look at verse 5. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Uh, there's another mention of them in 1 Corinthians 16, uh, 19. And Paul, basically, when he's waiting to die in the Mamertine prison in Rome, uh, before he's going to be executed, and he writes the last letter he writes, which is to Timothy, to Timothy, he mentions this couple, uh, once again, very, very close to them. Uh, I think the, the practical point here is the line about their occupation. Their occupation was tent maker, but obviously that's not who they were, and that's not what they did. Uh, they were out having church in their home. They were out being used by God. Uh, they were out uh, sharing the word with others, and that's who they were. But they had to earn a living somehow, so that was their occupation. You know, and, and sometimes we don't really understand that as, as believers. We have a tendency to, to think that, that how we earn a living is who we are. Now, it's just an occupation. It's, it's just, that's all it is. Uh, what we do is what we do for Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God, whatever that might be. Whether it's fixing up bicycles in your neighborhood and giving away to kids who don't have them and tell them that Jesus loves them, or it's teaching a Sunday school class. That, that is what you do for the Lord is actually who you are. The other thing is just a, uh, an occupation. I, I'll give you a little example of this. <coughs> I love to pick up people that are not here, so you should attend regularly. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, Manuel and Joe's that sweet couple, and uh, they're in Southern California right now. He's working over there for his sister. But uh, when he first came to church a number of years ago, he introduced himself. <laughs> and I, I asked him, you know, the typical guy question, you know, what, what, what do you do for a living? And he says, uh, I'm a soccer coach. Wow, that's pretty cool. And then we talked a little bit, and I got to know him a little more, and he's, he played professional soccer in Europe and everything. And, you know, it was, uh, came to, uh, anyways, big time soccer player when he was uh, younger. Uh, and he was a soccer coach. Wow, that's, well, that's awesome. You know, I coach a little baseball. I don't think I ever a living at it, though. So, you know, God, God bless you, man. And, you know, and then, uh, anyway, so it's like a year later, we're in church, and then he goes, I want to introduce you to my boss. You know, it's like, wow, he's, got, he's a soccer coach, and he's got a boss. And, you know, so I meet this gal. She's visiting at church, and she's from Queens Hospital. So I'm like, didn't know they had soccer coaches there, you know. <laughs> and uh, I was like, so how is, how is that your boss? I thought you were a soccer coach. He goes, no, I, well, I'm an accountant. You know, I, I work at Queens Hospital. That, that, but that's, that's not what I do. 
I mean, what I do is I'm a soccer coach. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, you know, I, I go out there, I've got a certain skill set, I teach these kids, the parents want me to teach their kids, I do workshops, I meet with them with parents, and then I try to get them to the house for a Bible study and share the gospel with them. I mean, that's, that's my ministry, that's, that's who I am, I'm the soccer coach. The counting is just, that's, that was his occupation, he has the right idea, that's the idea here. That's who, who these guys are. Uh, it's a very interesting life, and their occupation was, but it's just like a byproduct. We've got to pay the bills, but who are we really uh, in terms of the, the kingdom of God? He mentions also this wonderful uh, couple of verse 4, who risked their own necks for my life. Now, we don't have any history on that, not recorded in the book of Acts, not mentioned again, but uh, I would imagine there's a few people that risked their life for, for Paul because it seemed like his life was always being risked <laughs> somewhere. Uh, along the way, and apparently they were used by God to uh, to spare him. Uh, thirdly, special attention is seen in relationships, and and we I'm just saying that uh, that's based on affection. Uh, there's four times uh, that he uses the word beloved. Uh, one of them is uh, Epaenetus, who is the first convert in Achaia. So when he gets there, apparently that's the first guy he's able to lead to the Lord. Uh, he's mentioned uh, Ampelius, uh, Statius, uh, Paris, also beloved uh, of the Lord. And then affection, but also uh, in terms of apostleship, we have uh, in verse 7 greet uh, uh, Andronicus and Junia, uh, my countrymen or kinsmen can be translated, fellow prisoners, and uh, <laughs> done some time together, who are of note among the apostles. So apparently uh, these two... Uh, Andronicus and Junia are both uh, apostles as well. There's lots of apostles that are that are mentioned uh, in the New Testament. You've got the twelve, sometimes tongue in cheek, uh, which is harder to do if you have a recall in your mouth. But tongue in cheek, you have uh, it's a little inside joke there. Uh, you've got A apostles, uh, and then you I say you got B apostles. So you got the twelve uh, that are mentioned. Uh, and uh, but you've got many others. Timothy, and there's a whole bunch of others that are referred to as, as apostles. Why? Well, if you take the word apostle, translate into Latin, you start getting a word that sounds like it gets translated into English, which is missionary. It's missionology, and it goes into missionary. Uh, it's somebody that's literally one sent, one that's sent out. So there were a lot that took the gospel out, uh, like our modern day missionaries do today. And in that day, uh, they refer to as uh, as apostles. Uh, I wouldn't recommend putting that on your business card uh, or anything if you've shared the gospel with somebody that doesn't necessarily qualify you. I think people might misunderstand. But uh, these are guys that uh, he's greeting. They are missionaries uh, spreading the gospel there in the Roman Empire in the first century. And then the activity for the Lord. Special attention to Mary. She's a fellow laborer, Urbanus, a fellow worker. Uh, and then the, these two gals, very interesting, Tryphena and Tryphosa, uh, which based on their names uh, probably indicates that they were twins. Uh, their names mean dainty and delicate. Uh, so dainty and delicate were women who worked hard in the Lord. And the phrase worked hard means to the point of exhaustion. It would be used of an Olympic athlete or wrestler or something like that. Somebody that is just spent, that has no energy left. So dainty and delicate <laughs> would work themselves to the point of exhaustion, and uh, Paul makes reference to them. Parents who labored much in the Lord as well. Uh, and then there's the acceptance of all believers, a great appellus, tested and approved. So we don't know what that's about, but apparently went through some difficult circumstances. Uh, God uh, saw him through it. Paul acknowledges uh, that he went through this time uh, of testing. And then the household of Aristobulus. Uh, again, here's a person that's able to uh, influence their entire household. Uh, Herodian, my countryman or relative, uh, so obviously the person is, uh, is Jewish uh, as well. You have this mixture of Gentiles and Jews there in the church. Uh, <coughs> tradition says this is the grandson of Herod the Great, but we don't really, really know that. We can't really uh, uh, prove that by any historical documentation. And then Rufus. Now Rufus becomes an interesting character because we know a little more about him. Rufus is mentioned in, uh, in Mark 15, 21. When Jesus is carrying his cross on the Via del Rosia, and he's going up and he stumbles and he cannot carry it anymore uh, because of the beating he's undergone, the loss of blood and so forth, uh, the Romans, which uh, 
they had the legal right to do could pull somebody out of the crowd, which they did, and had to carry the, uh, the cross of Jesus, and that was, uh, that was Simon of, of Cyrene. So Simon carries the cross, and when Mark is writing his gospel, who he is writing primarily uh, to the church at Rome, he mentioned Simon, the son of, uh, uh, you know, whose two kids are, are basically uh, uh, Rufus uh, is one of them. Uh, and then Paul mentions that uh, and his mother is like a mother to me. Uh, now one writer uh, uh, basically says it this way, uh, if a man is identified by the names of his sons, it means that although he himself may not be personally known to the community to whom the story is being told, the sons are. To what church did Mark write the gospel? Almost certainly he wrote it for the church of Rome, and he knew that the church would know Alexander and Rufus, who they were. Uh, he was the son of Simon who carried the, uh, the cross of Jesus. So there's every reason to believe that the Rufus in the church there, his father carried the cross of, of Jesus Christ. I think he probably had a pretty good story to tell there. You know, <laughs> you know so yeah, Paul, Paul knew him. And he knew him so well uh, that uh, he says, and his mother is like a mother to me, uh, and, uh, which is a, a pretty pretty cool. And obviously he spent, spent some time there, and uh, uh, the amount of times Paul got beat up, I'd say he needed a little mother uh, along the way. Uh, it makes reference uh, to uh, Rufus and his mother. And then uh, special attention uh, in the greeting itself uh, in verse 16. Greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ uh, greet you. And, uh, and this is what the church uh, is to be all about. Not that we, uh, uh, and again, the holy kiss there would be guys to guys, but you grab the beard, you know, as you kind of give the kiss on the cheek. So uh, uh, we won't do this unless we all decide to uh, <laughs> do the Doug Dynasty thing or something, you know. Uh, but... Uh, uh, you know, but you know, it was uh, it was just kind of a normal thing to show actually show affection in the church, and you know we're we're blessed to be in Hawaii, uh, and, and we talk about the weather and the beauty, but you know it's you know, Hawaii is the people of Hawaii that are really distinctly different. Uh, you know, if you grow up here, you just think this is the way it is everywhere. It's like it's not. <laughs> people are not that friendly in a lot of other places. They they are in some places, and it's a, it's a blessing, but a lot of places they're not, and. Um, uh, you know, you just walk up talking to a total stranger here, and it's okay. You know, it's it's like you know other places they think you're weird. You know, they're calling the police. You know, uh, it's it's different, and, uh, uh, and and we we you know, so we're blessed in that sense, and uh, and I think that culture carries over into the church, which it uh, which it should, and it's a, uh, and it's a blessing. Uh, you know what we have. Uh, I read a, an article from uh, about a gal, 87 years old. She's a widow living in Grand Rapids, and she said the following. She said, uh, I don't blame people for not uh, taking the time to see me. I'm not very interesting. Everybody I knew was dead or moved away. I'd like to talk to somebody who's alive. Uh, I'd like some company. Uh, and then this little article just kind of went on her day, her typical day, 6.30 in the morning. Uh, her toast and coffee, waters her garden, which is five plants, uh, potted plants in the kitchen tidies up and basically stares out the window the rest of the day until 8.30, she has a light supper, she, she goes to bed, that's it. There's just a lot of lonely people that are out there. And one of the reasons is they're not in the body of Christ, and if they're lonely in the body of Christ, then there's something, there's something very wrong with that, and we understand uh, the heart of Paul here. Charles Reich, in his book, The Green Union of America, said, uh, America is one vast, terrifying anti-community. Uh, the great organizations to which most people give their working day in the apartments and suburbs to which they return at night are equally places of loneliness and alienation, protocol, competition, hostility, fear that replace the warmth of the circle of affection which might sustain man against a hostile universe. And so Paul's heart here should challenge us uh, in terms of uh, affection towards one another, showing uh, affection towards uh, uh, towards one and one another, and uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I told the first service somebody threw rocks at me or anything, so yeah, I don't know about you listeners. They're not, but I was, you know, it's just different here uh, in Hawaii because uh, you know, um, you know, like when we're at a family party uh, and uh, one of our nieces are getting ready to leave. What do they do? They go around and they kiss every uncle before they go out the door. Or their father's going to go, oh, you know, and uh, uh, you know, it's just uh, that's all normal. And, uh, uh, and sometimes I, uh, I probably 
<laughs> get carried away. You know, I'll, I, uh, I I don't know. I'm not as old as Charlie, but uh, I, I still, uh, and maybe I hug, hug the girls too much going out, but it's, it's just a blessing to, to see you guys. And if they're local, I know it's kind of okay, you know, because it's just, hey, you know, it's just normal. And if I don't, it's like I'm rude, you know. Uh, but I but I, I have to be careful. I never, I'll tell you who it is in a minute, but there was a, one of the gals, she was kind of new in the church, she was going by. She she looked papa, she looked local. And uh, and I and I, I just as I bent down to give her a hug, I saw her eyes get like big as saucers, like the pastor is going to punch me, you know. <laughs> look and uh, and I realized I don't think she's local, you know. And, uh, and that was Jake and Lauren. And, uh, and anyway, and she wasn't, you know. And she could have had the look, but she was from the mainland. But uh, um, but she grew to love me anyway. And uh, she became a beautiful hula dancer. And. Uh, and uh, they're they're uh, they're over 29 bombs now, but uh, uh, you know it's just we're blessed, uh, and uh, and uh, sometimes maybe uh, we don't appreciate what we have, but uh, that's the way it's supposed to be uh, in in the church, uh, a love and affection one to another. This whole thing is built around this message from unity. What do we do when we disagree? We we had a couple of messages uh, about that, but Paul's the guy that gave so generously of his life, but again, Paul is the guy that was so blessed. To the church in Galatia, when he writes the letter, he says, you know, I appreciate the fact that when I was there, that you guys said if you could, you'd pluck your eyes out and give them to me. Obviously, you know, he's, you know, he's got a real problem with his eyes, and people are just, oh man, I wish there was something I could do for you, Paul. Uh, Jesus <coughs> said this in uh, Mark 10, 29, I tell you the truth, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and for the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and fields. And Paul, I think, experienced what we might call the hundredfold uh, principle there. I think he had a hundred mothers and a hundred farms and a thousand brothers and, and sisters that were out there because of the way that he treated people, his affection towards people, and certainly we're seeing that uh, in his heart uh, here. Uh, concerned about the assistance for Phoebe, special attention to uh, to fellow workers, and uh, and man, what a blessing to get a letter from the Apostle Paul that he mentions you in the letter. That's that's got to be pretty cool. Uh, and then he makes an appeal to watch out for those who cause division. He's going to protect them. He's concerned about them under the guise of the same idea of unity and uh, protection. Verse 17. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause division and offenses. Contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own bellies. And by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience has become known to all. Therefore I am glad uh, on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. I don't think he means he's going to crush him under your feet if you have short feet. I think that means in a short time. I just thought I'd throw that in for clarification. The appeal is to watch out for false uh, false teachers here. Contrary to the doctrine that you learn. Notice it in singular. Not to the doctrines, like the doctrines he's been talking about. To the, you know, personal pronoun, the, the doctrine single that you've learned. There's really only two possibilities here. One is the doctrine of grace. And certainly... Paul was always dealing with the Judaizers coming behind him and trying to teach the people uh, against him and against the gospel of grace uh, and lead them into uh, a relationship with Christ based on works. Uh, but more, more likely, the doctrine is the doctrine of the unity of, uh, of the church. Uh, that's what he's been talking about. That's his subject matter. That's his context. That's his concern at the end. In that context, Jews and Gentiles. Would they be able to have unity? Would the church uh, uh, continue to grow and survive uh, in that sense? Uh, and it's certainly a concern today. I mean, we've got the, those that cause division uh, contrary to teaching we've learned. They put obstacles in our way uh, in doctrine and so forth. If we could go the obvious, the Mormon Jehovah's Witness and so forth, the New Age movement. Uh, but uh, he's concerned about them, and we should be concerned as well. He warns over and over and over again in his epistles, uh, like he does to the elders that come down, 
uh, to Miletus and meet him on the beach. He's on his way to Rome. They, they pray together there, uh, and they're very weeping together, having to see Paul concerned about what's going to happen to him next. And that's where he says, you know, there's going to be savage wolves that come right in your midst to, uh, uh, to tear you apart. You need to be aware of that. And we certainly need to be concerned about people that would bring disunity within the body of Christ uh, within the local church, within our midst here, as well as false <coughs> doctrine and false uh, and false teaching, so we need to we need to be we need to be careful. You know, I, I don't think it's been a big issue for us. Praise praise the Lord over the years, but uh, it's still it's something we need to cer- certainly be uh, aware of. Somebody comes to you uh, and basically says something negative about somebody else. Well, that's called gossip. What if it's true? It's still gossip. <laughs> and you got to go, uh, 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 hit the brick. Excuse me. That's actually what you're doing here. I don't know if you realize this, but it sure sounds like gossip to me. Maybe you need to go to that person and get this all straightened out. This is different than a person coming and saying, i got some issues, and can I share it with you confidentially, and you can pray with me? Yeah, that's great. That's fine. <laughs> but then if you go, hey, did you hear what she's going through? Then that, that's not good. Uh, when you bring... Uh, the Bible says if you bring an accusation against an elder, you better have a couple of witnesses or you're in trouble. You know, uh, Because that's the way the enemy operates, to try to divide, to divide people off. Uh, it's certainly good for us to heed the, uh, the, warning, uh, the warning here. Uh, the appeal also includes their methods. Uh, it's by smooth words and flattering speech. They deceive the hearts of the simple. Simple doesn't mean simple-minded. It just means innocent. Uh, they, they just... Uh, they're just, they didn't even think about that somebody might lie about somebody else. They didn't even think about that somebody might do something deceptively uh, in the name of Christ uh, with the Bible in front of them and so forth. And yet people, uh, people do. Verse 18, for those who uh, are such do not deserve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And uh, that's, uh, that's just uh, not uh, a reference to uh, there being uh, uh, on Weight Watchers recently or anything. It's just simply reference to their own selfish desires. He uses the same phrase. Philippians 3, 317, uh, a reference to self-interest. And then thirdly, the appeal includes a promise that the God of peace will, uh, will crush Satan under your feet uh, shortly. And uh, so that's a promise to know that, hey, whatever we're going through, it's all going to come to pass. Uh, and that there is a point in time when, uh, when Christ will be crushed under us, uh, under our feet. Uh, it won't always be this way. It won't always be a struggle. We won't always have to deal uh, with our sin nature. We won't always have to live in a sinful uh, world. We won't always have to live in a world where Satan is out there and his cohorts bringing evil and tempting and so forth. Uh, one day it will all be all over uh, and it's a promise that uh, certainly we need to remember uh, ourselves. And fourthly, uh, there's a greeting on behalf of Paul's associates, verse 21 to 24. Timothy, my fellow worker, Lucius, Jason, uh, Sos, Hunter, uh, my countrymen, greet you. Uh, I, uh, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, my host, the host of the whole church, greet you. Erastus, the treasurer of the city, greet you. Cortus, a brother, uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Uh, amen. You notice that Paul keeps saying amen. Uh, and uh, what that means is absolutely nothing because he, of course, just keeps going right after that. But it seems, <laughs> seems like he's almost done. But uh, again, he's uh, uh, obviously dictating here. Uh, Tatius is uh, uh, writing down the words and probably is a professional scribe that's uh, uh, doing this for <coughs> Paul. And again, Paul's uh, thorn in the flesh from 2 Corinthians uh, was more than likely his eye problems that he mentions uh, in the letter to the church of Galatia, uh, as we said. Uh, and so he is the, the scribe writing it down. Paul typically would write uh, some of the few last words in his own uh, own handwriting. But basically, they're kind of at the end. And all these guys are, are gathered around, and it's kind of like, hey, hey, say hi to, for me, too, you know, kind of a thing. So they all get their... Uh, uh, their names thrown in there. Of course, you've got uh, Timothy, who is Paul's son of the faith, uh, and leads him to faith in Christ. Very interesting uh, because he's got then, uh, uh, he makes reference to him as his fellow worker, uh, and not his disciple, uh, not his protege. Uh, he said a lot of things. He says, that, but this young guy says, no, we're, we're fellow workers, man. We're, he's not like my assistant, you know. 
uh, we're fellow workers. Uh, we're in this uh, together. Kind of gives e equal billing there, which is uh, kind of cool. And then Lucius Jason, uh, Jason said Sospater, Sos our uh, fellow countrymen, our kids, so obviously they're Jewish. Now it's interesting, he makes a distinction between Timothy and the other three because he doesn't consider Timothy to be Jewish in a sense because his mother is, but his father was uh, Greek or Gentile. So it kind of separates Timothy and he mentions the others that, that are with him. Uh, mentions the brother that's uh, writing the letter. And then Gaius, who's uh, obviously the church meets in the home. Uh, they're staying, uh, staying with him. Uh, and in 1 Corinthians 1.14, uh, when he talks about baptism and leading people to Christ, he mentions uh, only two guys that he actually baptized, and one of them was Gaius, so obviously he led him to the Lord. And then Erastus, who's the uh, treasurer of the city, Corinth, which is, which is a big deal, Corinth at the time, City of 250, 300,000, pretty pretty big city for uh, you know the, you know big city today is like you know 15 million in Asia, but uh, in that day uh, that, was, that was a big city, and uh, Erastus is uh, one of the leading leading officials, maybe one of the top three officials uh, in the city. And apparently, he's come to faith in Christ. Uh, now, interesting, uh, within the last uh, however many years, uh, eight or ten years, uh, they've uh, uncovered uh, a stone in front of a public building. To have Rastus' name on it. Uh, again, we love it every time they uh, put a, a spade into the ground in the Middle East and continue to verify uh, the Bible and the details uh, of the Bible. And then Chorus, uh, Quartus, uh, is mentioned as a brother. And then his final benediction here, according to the Gospel, verse 25, Now to him who was able to establish you, according to my Gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began, but now made uh, manifest and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations, according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith, to God alone wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. So closing benediction, one that Paul's longest uh, in any of his letters, uh, and basically saying this church is established according to the gospel by the preaching uh, of Jesus Christ. The word established means to build up, to prop up, to hold up. And he says, uh, what's going to hold you up in your faith and your, your relationship with Jesus Christ? This is the gospel itself, that you're saved by grace. Uh, that's not going to change. It's going to continue to be grace alone. Uh, and he makes reference to that same idea in 1 Thessalonians, uh, and talking about being established, uh, that our hearts can be established as well. In Philippians 1 6, he says, Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. That was one of my big concerns when I first got saved and the Lord was doing things in my life. I just, man, I just, I just kind of needed to know that the, this train was going to keep going down the track, you know, that it wasn't going to, you know, go off and wreck somewhere, you know, and it's like, I was so thankful and appreciative of what God had done and what he delivered me from and, you know, wherever he might be taking me. And, and so I, I hung on to verses like Philippians 1.6 that uh, I'm kind of struggling now, but you know what? God is faithful. He's going to complete the work that he's begun. Now, those kind of verses uh, were very important to me. You know, the, the, uh, the 2 Corinthians 3.18, we without no basis all reflect the Lord's glory. And we're being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory. And it comes from the Lord. He was the Spirit. It's a work of the Spirit. You know, I can relax. <laughs> I can relax, you know, uh, in, in the Lord. He's going to establish me, you know, in the gospel, uh, the preaching of Jesus, based on, uh, secondly, again, the prophetic scriptures. And notice it to the nations of the world, uh, and here the idea of that mystery hidden in the past. Uh, again, in the Greek, uh, the, the, uh, you know, New Testament, first century, uh, not like we think of mystery today. Today's a mystery because uh, we need to figure out who who did it, you know, in, in the murder mystery. But in the New Testament, it's something that was hidden that has now been revealed. What's been revealed? Wow, that the gospel would go to all the nations, that you would have this crazy thing called the church that with Jews and Gentiles uh, in it together, <clears throat> something they were obviously uh, experiencing, something Paul detailed in Romans 9 to 11, it is as if it's all done for the praise and the glory of God. So here's Paul, the kind of the supreme intellect of the early church, uh, but uh, had a great heart uh, for for the gospel. Uh, I love these guys. And, well, you know, Paul, he's like that, you know, type A personality, just kind of one of those guys. 
No, Paul says, I was compelled by the love of God to do what I did. This is interesting to hear the, the, uh, uh, the psycho type, uh, psychologist type stuff. Uh, you know, <laughs> try, to, try to analyze, analyze these people in the Bible and uh, try to understand uh, their motivation. It's not, I was compelled by the love of Christ. Uh, and uh, obviously he just had a, a heart for getting the gospel out, but he had a heart for the people that got saved. You know, the great missionary, but the great pastor uh, as well. And apparently what we're seeing here, a great friend. And we, and we don't often think of Paul that way. But uh, he kind of, is uh, this is all very, very self-revealing here uh, in these uh, uh, final chapters. Uh, great visionary, great dream, uh, but a uh, great lover of people uh, as well. And concerned enough to warn them and, and seek to protect them. Uh, and, uh, man, I can't even hardly say these names. I don't know how he remembered them all. But uh, I think it's because he was in prayer for them on a, on a regular basis. And uh, someday we'll get to see him and, uh, and talk to him about these things. And it'll be, uh, it'll be awesome. Well, that's, uh, that's graduate school. So if you, if you got through Genesis and you got through Matthew and Revelation, that was your bachelor's degree. You get to uh, Daniel and Romans, which all we've done recently. Those are all cornerstones to any kind of a, a, a biblical college that you might go to. Those are kind of graduation requirements. So uh, it doesn't mean you can leave after this, but uh, it means you should be uh, well equipped for the uh, for the ministry uh, that God's called you to. Uh, don't don't quit your day job. You know, keep your occupation, but uh, see it as an occupation, and uh, know that the Lord has something greater than just earning enough money to pay the bills uh, in this life. Purpose and meaning. The purpose in life that gives us meaning makes a difference. Let's pray. Lord, we rejoice that, uh, that we got to do this. That we got to study this letter. We get to actually have a, a Bible that we take home and hold in our hands. It's actually in the language that we uh, we understand that there's a lot of people around the world that uh, would love to be doing what we've been able to do together so we don't take it for granted. We thank you. and Lord, we uh, we thank you for the, the church here. And we thank you for uh, the the love and the affection and, and the unity that, uh, that we have. And, and, uh, we pray that you watch over that and protect that. Lord, that we just simply wouldn't take it for granted, that we wouldn't take the people around us for granted. Lord, and I pray today that uh, or this week we might take the time to share that affection, that expression. Uh, it's a good thing. It's a healthy thing for us. And, uh, and we thank you for all we have. Thank you for the heart of Paul, and uh, we just pray that you would uh, uh, help us then take this love so divine that you given us and be able to uh, kind of wear it out there in the world where where there's just uh, people that are lonely and hurting and uh, we've, we've got the answers. Give us the boldness to share it and, uh, and the grace to do it in a way that represents you. We ask that Jesus name. Amen. You choose the humble and raise them high. You choose the weak and make them strong. You heal the brokenness inside and give us life. The same love that sets the cat.